Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 386. Do not pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. Bruce Lee. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Before we get started, guys, I set up a special link to help people affected by the coronavirus, and you can donate to Feed America. There is a lot of people in need out there, and Feed America is a great organization. And they're helping millions of people on a daily basis. And they also need your help. If you want to donate even five bucks, ten bucks, it goes a long way. Head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. Well, guys, today on the show, we have film producer Simon Swart. Now, Simon has been working in film production and distribution for over 30 years and was a leading studio executive at Warner Brothers, Walt Disney Studios, and 20th Century Fox. After leaving his last job, he decided to venture out and start producing his own films. And he created some very profitable films, including Six Below with Josh Hartnett and the mega indie film hit I Can Only Imagine, which grossed over $83 million at the box office. With those releases, he created a multi-window distribution model and he created new markets for the ever-shifting distribution space for competitive smaller studios. This third-party distribution model started with Lionsgate and then grew into MGM, Relativity, DreamWorks, and Mirabax and generated substantial fees and greater, greater efficiency and kind of knocking down the old distribution model. Anytime I can have somebody who is championing a new way for filmmakers and production companies and studios, small studios, to be able to make money with their films, I am all about it. I was very excited to talk shop with him and we really get into it in this episode. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Simon Swart. I'd like to welcome to the show Simon Swart, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. I appreciate it, man. You are, uh, you, you've you been around the block a few times. I, I, I know that you have some shrapnel in the, uh, from the business without question. Four words and experience. <laughs> yes. Some battle scars. <laughs> some battle scar, some shrapnel. Absolutely. So before we get into it, how did you get into the business? Wow. Um, I've got to tell you, um, I got into the business by sending my resume to every record company and music company on the West Coast and being completely rejected. And I ended up meeting a guy at a party, and it uh, turns out they were hiring somebody. They were looking for someone at Warner Brothers, and that was it. That's generally, isn't, isn't that the way it works? <laughs> the younger generation out there, you've got to send your resumes out there and do that stuff. But ultimately, it's probably your relationships and your contacts that are going to get you a job. And, and by the way, you don't get your dream job out the gate. You take whatever job is going and you do it to the best of your abilities. Wait, wait a minute. So you, so you mean to tell me that out of film school, uh, Kevin Fahey is not going to call you to direct the next $200 million Marvel movie? Like right out of film school as a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, 20-year-old? 
Probably not. I think it's a long shot. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> just it's a long shot. Happened. The, the golden tickets do exist. They're just rare. But but then and and I've 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 spoken about this golden lottery ticket mentality of filmmakers for so long because that's the one story that you hear. I mean, we're still talking about El Mariachi. I mean, yeah. it's I mean, it's like that these mythical stories, and these filmmakers think that that's the way it's going to work, and that's not the way this business runs. You, you've got to put in your 10,000 hours plus, and you might be getting coffee, you might be uh, driving people to and fro, but you do what you got to do, and you learn along the way. Without question. Now, what did you do when you uh, got over to Warner Brothers? Well, so here's the funny thing, by the way. I, I studied accounting and auditing. I was actually a chartered accountant by trade. So, okay. you know, uh, how did that all work out? Well, I was an art student who realized that I could I could probably immigrate better with a business degree than uh, with an art degree. Uh, so I did that basic math and I forced myself to learn business and things like that. Uh, and when I started at Warner Brothers, I was a manager of international finance, which was a glorious position. It, it sounds uh, very creative. <laughs> it was very creative, <laughs> not as much as you would think. Uh, but uh, but I would say my I, I worked through Warner Brothers. I then worked uh, for a small independent. I worked at Disney, and then I spent the last twenty years at Fox and uh, doing different roles and different functions. But but gradually getting into more and more creative roles, where I eventually became the head of sales, the head of uh, sales and marketing, and then I ran the distribution division for uh, the home entertainment side at Fox. For the last decade or so. So, since you were at Fox, uh, there was a few movies that they had uh, they had uh, ownership of uh, uh, that. Of course, now Disney because they, Disney owns everything. Uh, but at the time, you were responsible. Soon, soon yes, yeah, soon. I think I, I should be getting my check from the mouse at any day now, just to buy me out at this point. Um, but but while you were there, you got to work on a, a very prestigious uh, you know um, franchise, which is called uh, Star Wars. So how was that? What was the stories behind marketing Star Wars? And you were there when the re-release was happening, which was the 97 re-release, which was basically our first look. There was a whole generation who had never even seen Star Wars in the theater before. Yeah, it's, pre- it's pretty remarkable. I mean, uh, actually, what I, what I loved about the gig at Fox uh, on the, that side of the business was you were the curator of the studio's history. You And, and, and the great filmmakers all understand that um, – that their, their movies will be remembered not necessarily on the big screen. The launch is on the big screen, and we're all making movies for the big screen because it is such a remarkable experience as a consumer, as a fan, when their lights go out and you've got your popcorn and this, the, the imagery, the journey you go on is just so remarkable. But the legacy is going to be on the home screen, whether it's digital and whatever format you're going to get it, that's the legacy issue. And you're the curator of all this film history. And yeah, 97, we had a whole generation of Star Wars fans that, you know, your access to the movies was so limited. Now you get to re-release it and you're, you're, go- you're creating a whole new group of fans. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's Star Wars or it's a fair to remember or sound of music, you know, it's, it was, I loved that part of the job was working on the older movies and working on these classic franchises and keeping them alive. And you, it's a privilege to get to reintroduce them to new audiences, frankly. Now, how, what, can you talk a little bit about the marketing mindset about around relaunching Star Wars in the theaters? Cause that was a, I, I remember in that time that it was considered a risk. I still remember it was considered a risk and they were talking about like, why would they do this? It's available on VHS, you know what? And it killed, obviously it made an obscene amount of money. Sure. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, Luke, Lucasfilm was integral in everything that we did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing, one thing about George Lucas and the guys at Lucasfilm is they were so protective of their fans, right? They wanted, they, they respect their fans. They, uh, Everything was about protecting the fans and giving them giving them what they wanted, uh, and you know, listening. I mean, they're, they're one of those brands that always had a dialogue with their fans, and mm-hmm. they've had those super fans for a reason. So everything we did was about servicing the fans, uh, and yeah, releasing the movie out there. I want to say, if I remember correctly, we did something like a million over a million units of a of a trilogy. People are like, there's no way you're going to sell a million units of a, of a trilogy that's from a movie that was released sort of, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, everyone's moved on. It's like, eh, not so much, you know. <laughs> like we were and, saying. 
and and we love proving people wrong. Yeah, like we you were know, saying, he, like we were saying before uh, when we were off air, is like I've purchased the Star Wars movies on pretty much every format ever released. Yeah, and and honestly, the the marketing challenge in that right was always making sure you were giving the fans a reason to buy it again. Mm-hmm. Not you're not buying just the same product again. Right. So whether when there were technological advances, like we were able to digitize and remaster, like when we moved to DVD and Blu-ray and re-release them on those formats, you know, we were able to go back and actually, uh, you know, Lucasfilm went back and fixed some of the scenes because the VFX weren't weren't translating properly and technology had advanced so much. And that was pretty controversial as well. So, I mean, one of the marketing decisions we had to make is. I think when we did the DVD, we released it in the original format and the original resolution and in the enhanced version where it had been digitized and some of the digital effects had been cleaned up and so on. So, the, you know, the fans were very clear they wanted both. They wanted the original the way I saw it in theaters way back when. But I also would like to see the new updated version, too. So it was kind of rare. We did we did some some re- some pretty creative things back then, um, you know, releasing the. Releasing releasing both movies in the same package, you know, you can have both versions. Now, you 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 were in charge of a lot of marketing of a lot of big franchises during your tenure uh, at Fox and, and at Disney. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about what it's like working with the studios and what a typical marketing plan is for a blockbuster film? Because you know the rollouts, the understanding. Because we we on the show we've talked a lot about independent film marketing and. You know, niche audiences and grassroots and all this stuff, but I would love to hear from the inside what is the plan? Like, okay, we're going to spend you know, X dollars on billboards and this kind of ads and these kind of ads. And of course, technology has changed a bit since uh, probably a lot of those earlier releases. But I'm just curious. So I, I think one of the biggest things is uh, you know back back in the '90s you had a slightly more homogenous uh, plans, right? You would have your billboards, you'd have your radio, you have your print. You have your trailering, right? And you had television. So you knew you knew who the audience was that you needed to open the movie. Obviously, there's a lot of testing done in those days, even pre-digital. Uh, we'd test the movie against the audiences so we knew what the rating was. And every marketing plan was different depending on the genre, the size, and the scope of the movie. Okay, so you know the, the, the worst thing you can do, and, and sometimes you can see studios getting a little lazy about it, is there's the cookie-cutter approach, right? This is the way we've done it. And that, that kind of strategy went out the window quite a long time ago, um, especially now uh, with the challenges of mass market uh, marketing. So if you're buying media on TV, you now have to supplement it with social media and online media, and that becomes a much bigger piece of the budget. So the marketing of these movies has always been dynamic, and it's always been risky, right? That hasn't changed. It's just a matter of where you're spending the money and where you're taking the risk. And it also depends on who your target target audience is. If you go back 20 years ago, the sweet spot of of opening blockbusters was males 18 to 34, mm-hmm. right? Like if you could get the fanboys in to go see your movie, you were made. You knew you'd make your number. You'd get the butts and seats. And now, you know, 2019, you know that's just not the case anymore right. because those fanboys are, you know, they're 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 ADD basically on the media world. You don't know where they're everywhere. Um, and I think one of the coolest things that's actually occurred in the marketing space is, you know, the, the old school marketing demographics don't work. They don't work anymore. We, we don't identify. The audiences don't identify based on ethnicity, social class, gender as much as we'd like them to. Audiences identify based on interests, behaviors, passions. So and and it, it's not it's very hard to do mass marketing anymore. You know, the the, the the it's diminishing returns on what you're getting out of TV. You know, you've got to advertise on certain cable channels and you've got to be in certain events. I mean, Super Bowl ads are probably one of the rare exceptions where everybody is probably going to see your ad. And then you've got to supplement it with online and social media. But your online and social media can't just be a replication of what you're doing on radio and what TV. They've got to be unique to that format. And I think that's one of the one of the cool things that's going on in the marketing space right now. But is is it? I've noticed this just from just being a watcher of the industry. I've noticed that from the days of when I was coming up in the '90s to today, the studios are having a more difficult time, even them with their massive resources, 
to actually get to the audience to get because there's so much more competition. I mean, those those fanboys, a lot of them are just sitting in front of a video game for 15 hours a day. They're not interested in going to the movie theater anymore. So it's much even it's even difficult and challenging with hundreds of millions of dollars. How do you, how do you break through even with a eighty million dollar spend? And by the by the way, you've got to recoup that too. So right. you know you spent three hundred million dollars making the movie. Now you've got to spend maybe another hundred and fifty million dollars marketing it. And most people don't understand that whatever the box office is, you've got to cut it in half right off the bat because exhibition takes half, and then you've got to recoup your marketing costs, and then you've got all these other expenditures in there. So it it gets pretty crazy because. When you start having to spend against social media and stuff, is that an incremental spend or are you taking a dollar away from your, your mass market TV? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the reality is you can't take away the dollar because you still need that mass market TV. And by the way, you still need those cable spots because that might be where your target audience is, is, is as well, right? And you've also got to spend money on PR and publicity to break through. So really kind of your, your, your marketing campaign is almost a, it's a military campaign of sorts. But it's and, all geared towards opening weekend. Right, right. But but I've noticed that opening weekends, I mean, depends, of course, on the on the on the franchise or on the blockbuster that's coming out. But opening weekends aren't what they used to be. Sometimes they they, they will explode and we'll have the two hundred million dollar, one hundred and fifty million dollar, ninety million dollar like the Joker did recently. You know, you know, those are that was a surprise. But but those those numbers aren't as much as they used to be in box art. Like look at that Will Smith movie, The Gemini Man, that just tanked yeah, you know yeah. which is a whole conversation about movie stars do they even matter anymore oh i think movie stars definitely matter i think that the model is changing where you have those you know the classic star driven vehicles mm-hmm. the content mm-hmm. still needs to be really good right, right. you can't right. just do those vanity projects i think what's happened is there's this massive uh um you know the days of the studio chief being the the thought leader or the you know the tastemaker for the whole country. Mm-hmm. You know I'm going to do a st- I'm going to I'm going to create a relationship with a movie star and I'm going to give them thirty to forty percent of the budget or something crazy like that because it's there in it it's automatically going to open. You know those days are long gone, right? The content needs to deliver. It needs to be good, right? And I and I think that's that's one of the many changing things that's going on in the film space. I mean, you know, in the industry, we laugh about the the back end participation, right? Because it's invisible. The whole point behind the back end participation was that you would allow your talent to share in the upside of a movie, so you keep them engaged. The reality is, with studio accounting being what it is, that back end never materializes. Okay, so so stars have to figure out a different way to get paid. So what they would do is they'd take a disproportionate share of the budget. All that does is shift all the risk back to the studio, in essence. So I think these economic models are all changing as the realities change. And the technology is changing that as well. And the reality is everybody doesn't fully understand or I'd say nobody fully understands what the future of media consumption is going to be. It's not going to be one thing. It's not going to be just theatrical. It's not going to be just streaming. It's going to be a balance of all of these technologies. And now where does the the humble independent filmmaker fall into all of this 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 conversation in general? Well, it's fascinating. I think the challenge for the independent filmmaker has been that as uh, studios have moved away from the mid-level star-driven movies and the smaller movies, they're focusing more on the big franchises, right? The reality is, in my mind, that's a Disney game. Disney wins that game every time because they're a licensing franchise machine. That's what they do, right? Even Bob Iger says, "I I love the movies we're making, but I also love great indie films and those art house films. Which is ironic, but he goes, but he's he's clear that those are not the, the movies that Disney's going to be making, right? Okay, and and that that's that's obviously very very uh, uh, revealing, but it's it's insightful. He knows what their core strength is, and he plays to it, and he's brilliant at that. Um, but for the other studios, that leaves a lot of in between, right? If you don't have the theme parks and you don't have that big licensing machine for all the all the toys and the T-shirts and all the other stuff that goes with it. You know, where does that leave you with the independent films and those mid-level movies? Because there is still a market for them. But but the risk is the risk is what it's always been. The reality is the studios aren't going to put up that money. So as an independent producer, you have to go raise the money to make the movie. You can then partner up with the studio for a distribution deal or a service deal, and that's the way to go. Then the challenge is when you, 
you have to raise, as an independent filmmaker, you've got to be thinking about how am I going to raise the money to actually make the movie? But at the same time, how am I going to raise the money to actually market the movie? Because if you don't think about that until you finish the movie, you're at risk. Because that guy who comes in and puts up the PNA will then take control of the project. That is the model right now. And I think the innovation is going to come with your releasing strategy. So the challenge for the independent filmmaker is I'm not making a movie for Netflix per se. I'm not going to make a movie for Amazon per se. But I've got to structure my financing in such a way that I know how I'm going to get to market. And the higher your budget goes over $10 million, mm. the only way out is the theatrical release or you've got to have, you've got to have covered your, most of your negative with your foreign pre-sales, Right. So you structure your financing creatively. But most people don't think that way, right? That's, that's not always – there's a few people that get that. Um, but for most indies, like you've got to figure out what your strategy is. Uh, to me, Netflix is a, is a great strategy. But just remember with Netflix, there's not a lot of upside. There's a great business model and they're okay paying the premium if they own, the, if they own your IP. That's, that's the way they're working right now. Um, but, they're, but they're predominantly focused on big, big names too. You know, if you can get that golden ticket, you know, Martin Scorsese with The Irishman, uh, you know, that's a good deal. You, you, they, they pay you a, a big chunk of money for the movie and the rights and you make it for less than that. You know, the margin is what you get to keep type of thing. So the independent film model is actually a pretty exciting place to be right now. But you've got to really understand the distribution opportunities that are ahead of you at the point that you're creating your budget. And you've got to know who your audience is. That, yeah, that was what I was about to say, because I, I mean, I speak to independent filmmakers on a daily basis, and I'm going to say 95% of them are the creative producer, the creative director, and they're not the business person. They do, they're creating a product and have no idea where to sell it. And I'm, I'm yelling at the top of my lungs from the top of the mountain I can and going, look, if you're a real estate developer and you make condos, you know who you're going to sell those condos to. You don't just make a condo, uh, you know, a, a twenty, you know, twenty unit condo and go. Now let's see what we're going to do. You, you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. What what what's your business plan? Who's your audience? Who are you making this for? What are you hoping to accomplish by making this movie? Right. Um, because if you can answer those questions, and you know, the first question I'll ask any independent producer or non-independent producer uh, director is, what is this movie most like? What do, you, what do you believe your end product is going to be most like? Can you name five movies for me that you think this movie is like? And part of that is understanding expectations, right? It's also understanding tone. But oftentimes, if you've got an indie a filmmaker coming and saying, I've got an $8 million budget movie or a $4 million budget movie, and it's most like uh, Star Wars and or it's most like uh, uh, Avatar. Avatar. <laughs> you go, okay, that had like a $300 million budget. And you're going to do it for eight. And James Cameron. <laughs> it's probably yeah, and James Cameron, and and you know, and John Landau, and a studio behind you, and so on. It's like you've got to level set expectations, right? Whereas if you're making a movie that's a ten million dollar budget, and one of your comps is Juno, and one of them is Napoleon Dynamite, perhaps now you go, okay, now I'm listening. Right now I'm listening because you know if you're going to spend ten million dollars making a movie, and you've you've laid off half of it with foreign. Your net exposure is $5 million, and maybe you've got a one, one $1.5 million tax credit. Take advantage of all that. Your exposure for you and your investors is $3.5 million. At that point, a great streaming deal gets you into a pretty good place and gets everyone to see your movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like understanding you, how you're going to go to market. What's your perfect end goal, right? And Here's the thing is for us and for, for where my company's at right now uh, for NTB Pictures and Tiba is we really want to make movies for the big screen. And I know that's counterintuitive with what people are talking about in the industry and so on. But we're going to make them for the big screen. We want them to be big and cinematic. We're not going to do the big budget. You know, the, our biggest budget's probably 10 to $15 million. Mm-hmm. Because at 10 to $15 million, you can get a great cast, you can get a great director, you can make something that's beautiful and deserves to be on the big screen. And by the way, if you fumble and the movie doesn't end up as good as you wanted it to be, at that budget range, you can make money still without a theatrical release. With a certain cast, obviously. With a certain cast, and if you package it, if you know who your audience is, you know. Um, you know again, again, the challenge is you need probably a minimum – and there are a lot of people that will say, 
you need $25 million minimum to open a movie in the U.S. I disagree with that. I think if you know who your audience is and you build your audience early and you're creative on the social side, you can open for much less than that. You know, probably around eight to 10 for a relatively wide release. Um, you know, you, you, but you've got to figure out where you're going to get that money from and how you're actually going to get that, get that into the marketplace, right? Yeah, and you could also. I mean, there's there's so many different ways of doing it. I mean, I've I've had multiple I've had multiple um, guests on, and I've done case studies of films that are are low budget. They're a mil or two million dollars, but they knew their audience so well, and huh? they targeted them so well, and they worked on them for a year, year and a half, cultivating that audience. By the time that movie came out. They killed it. They were pulling three, four theatrical. And a lot yeah. of it, it was self theatrical where they were doing, you know, uh, neither four walling or um, on demand screenings and they were just killing it. It, it, yeah. it was, it, but it, there's a lot of work and you really need to understand so many elements for, the, for that to happen. And most of those films, by the way, were not star powered. They were no, I, genre powered or story powered. Yeah, I think for, for an indie, you build your audience while you're shooting or before you're shooting. Just yeah. start. Yeah, you know, don't don't give up the movie. Don't don't trip anything that would turn off a potential future distributor. But start building your audience as soon as possible. Now, can you tell me? I mean, you've had great success going after niche audiences, specifically uh, your film "I Can Only Imagine," which was a runaway blockbuster in the realm of what you do, which is faith based films. And can you tell everybody a little bit about that film, uh, and then how much it grossed, and because it was it was a fairly impressive movie. Uh, and what was the budget of that film, right. if you don't mind me telling you, asking? You know, I, I think a lot of the, all the credit on that movie should go to you know to the Irwin brothers, Cindy Bond. I mean, they they made something amazing. And you know, the Irwin brothers I'd worked with when I was um, at Fox, and we set up our whole third party distribution uh, model at Fox. And the the Irwins were a group, a young filmmakers who who I came across there, and they had a little movie called October Baby. Um, and uh, it was very much a faith-based movie, but it was really beautiful and well shot. And uh, that was where our relationship with them started. And they've just come along so much as filmmakers. You know, they've got two two A Cinema scores going in the in the in the faith-based space. Uh, two general market A Cinema scores. They're great filmmakers. And I think I can only imagine what worked with I can only imagine is we had a built-in audience. It was based on a number one contemporary Christian song of all time. So it was a massive audience. Most people didn't know the story behind the song. Uh, Generally, most so, people don't care about the, the story behind the song. But yeah. for this song, but this song did. I even know the song, and it's not that's not the, the music I listen to. You said, but I heard that song a thousand out. times. Oh, it it broke it broke out of the out of Christian music because people just loved the song. It was inspirational and just for 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 giving people hope in music. I mean, it is the power of the medium. So we so we knew we had a built in audience on that one. And you know, the Irwin brothers did magic. You know, they 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 grew up shooting. Uh, you know, doing sports and and music anyway. And and they were the right guys to do this project. And this and this movie is a universal story. It is about so you got a built in audience. That's a major plus factor. Our budget was less than ten million dollars. Um, they started building the audience a year over a year out with limited screenings and so on. And you know the movie's kind of a bit of a love letter to Nashville as well. But it deals with these fundamental issues of forgiveness. It doesn't become overtly preachy, but it's really a father-son story. But there's a love story in there also. And I think when you look at that movie, it delivers on all the beats that it's set up. So no matter what you believe, it doesn't force you to into a, a certain belief paradigm. You do believe in forgiveness. You do believe in love. You do believe in redemption, right? We all love those kind of underdog stories. And that's what this is. You know, it was basically a story about a kid who uh, gets beaten by his father, uh, who's a heavy drinking, um, you know, uh, abusive dad. And uh, eventually he he has to come to a point where he's he can reconcile with his father. And he, he does this, this beautiful reconciliation. It's based on a true story. And I, I think, you know, that's the power of a true story, too, is that you go, yeah, that actually happened. That guy got through it. He did that. This is what he accomplished. If he can do that, I can do that. You know, and that's that's something that's kind of cool about these story-driven uh, uh, pictures. Yeah, and that movie, if I'm not mistaken, made about 84 million domestic in the, in the theatrical, which is 
for a he fake did base. Ford Domestic, and uh, and again, it was a very limited marketing spend. Um, the team at Lionsgate Roadside did a great job um, releasing that, and uh, you know, uh, we we had a lot. To the, the producers had a lot to do with the releasing of that movie. And the, but, we but, but you understood, about. but the producers yeah. also understood their niche so well that they understood that I'm, 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 I'm assuming that any marketing spend wasn't just billboards and TV ad buys. They were going after churches. They were going after yep. where that niche audience lived. Yeah, we, we, uh, some of the best, uh, sort of agencies in the, in the business were, were hired on that and helped guide that with, uh, with Roadside and Lionsgate. And, you know, that was an example of everything going really well. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, I think the Owens have another movie coming out. I forget the name. Um, I still believe, I think, uh, which is coming out in March. And every, every indication is it's going to be another hit. It looks amazing. The anticipation's there. If you look it up on social media, you can see the kind of following it's got already. Um, and again, that's just an example of building your audience early on. And it's a story that people know about in the community. And you know it's going to be a well-made story because you know what this, these filmmakers' brand is. And and yeah, exactly. And and they are building a brand around their themselves as oh, like the, the Irwin brothers. It's like Spielberg is a brand, and Scorsese is a brand. Yeah. And they're also doing it for a smart number too. It's like it, it's not like they're making this for a hundred million dollars. Right. Right. The budgets are very. The budgets are very rational. If you've got a very targeted audience, you know. I, again, I think as an indie filmmaker. You've always got to rationalize your budget. That's part of knowing who your audience is and how you're going to go to market. Right? So make, making a movie for $20 million when you can get the same result uh, for eight or nine, you know, that's just asking for trouble. I mean, you know, one, one of the most famous uh, indies of, of, of recent memory is Get Out. Hmm. I mean, look at, how, look at Jordan Peele's brand. Look at how he's exploded, you know. But he didn't just show up. He paid his dues, you know, he took some creative risks. But, you know, I want to say Get Out was made for, what, less than $5 million. Mm-hmm. You know, and that did, I think that did over 100. And oh, then no, his, he's, it did, it did uh, it, I think it did like 200 something. Uh, some, it was some crazy number and what a brilliant movie it was. It was just so fresh, right? Right. And, 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 but with that, that's one of those, you know, he was with the Bloomhouse guys. So, and that's a whole other conversation, what Bloomhouse has been able to do. And they've been so smart. Yeah. So, so that that's one of my other points as an indie filmmaker. Don't comp yourself to a lightning strike. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Don't, like, oh, but, oh, yeah. My movie's just like Paranormal Activity. My movie's yeah. just like Blair Witch Project. <laughs> yeah, we're all aware of the outliers, right? It's like, um, you know, what? Actually, when I was working at Disney, the first movie I got to work on was Lion King. Okay, and this is something I learned. Every other movie, animated movie that came out after Lion King was the next Lion King. And the problem is they were all very successful, but they didn't do what Lion King did, so they were deemed failures. And so it's kind of like don't bench your, mark yourself for an outlier. I think the key thing in independent film is that you've got to set yourself up where singles and doubles are a good thing. But if you hit a home run, you're great, right? But you're playing for the singles and doubles, like get on base, just get on base, you know? That that sets you up for your next project, your next thing. And if you hit a home run, you're, you're ready to go. And it's kind of like it, every project I look at now, it's like, how do I get back to break even, right? Failure should be break even. And I wanna know that I've got a plan for break even. And then how do I set myself up? Will this, is this movie capable of a disproportionate return? Right. And the disproportionate return is that big, you know, the Juno type number, the Napoleon Dynamite type number, the get out type number. It's like, but you're not banking on the breakout. You're banking on a single or a double. Have, like you, been, have you been listening to my podcast, sir? Because you literally said the exact thing I've said <laughs> so many times with my baseball analogy. I go, everybody wants to go up to bat and hit a home run. But most people, when they make their first movie, haven't even been in a baseball stadium or picked up a bat before <laughs> and they're expecting to hit a home run at the beginning where there's that other guy or girl who's been in the batting cage just hitting away, hitting away, yep. hitting away and just practicing until they finally get their shot up at bat. You know, it's yeah. it's fascinating. The, 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 the egotistic mind of the filmmaker, which there is a few egos in our business, just a few, not many. 
Um, but we we have these delusions of grandeur uh, as filmmakers. I definitely had for many years. Uh, you know, I was going to be the next this, or my film was going to do this thing. I'm sure you've run into this many times. So, in fairness to Indie Hustle, I won't reveal my sources. Okay, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I run into it all the time. It's a process, right? And you, and you're going to pay your dues. You've got to learn, right? And by the way, there's a ton of people out there that will help you. As an indie filmmaker, mm-hmm. you've got to build up your network. Find the people that can help you and advise you. There's a lot of people that will give you advice for relatively free. Don't pay for the advice yet. You know, you know verify. It's like I see a lot of people getting suckered by paying people to, to market their movies when they haven't fully vetted them and they make bad deals and so on. There's a lot of people out there that will advise you as an indie filmmaker. There's a lot of resources out there available to you. But remember, it's a slog. And, you know, I mean, my hat's off to anyone who actually makes a movie because a, a movie, even if it's shot on your iPhone and it's edited and put together, it's a it's a pretty significant creative accomplishment. No matter you know, just to actually pull that all together, mm-hmm. right? Getting people to perform and so on. I mean, when when you've been on sets of on indies, you know, I enjoy indies because there's there's a lot of less there's a lot of less less room for waste. So everybody's very mission focused. And usually that crew is tight, man. It's like they will do – they're in battle, man, and they're going to get the shots. They're going to get the coverage. And, you know, the, the, your indie director is is the ultimate team leader because he doesn't have money to throw around the way a big studio director might have, right? It's like you've got to do this for the passion. You've got to enroll your entire uh, cast and crew in your vision for what you're doing. And, I, and that isn't easy. That takes a lot of practice. That's why it's like working on other people's movies is really uh, one of the best ways to learn because you, you, you're in this together. You problem solve together. Without, without questions, preach, sir, preach, preach. <laughs> <laughs> now, we wanted to talk a little bit about distribution and distribution options for independent filmmakers. You know, I've talked a lot uh, about distribution on my show and on my other show, Film Entrepreneur, where it's about how to get your film out there. And it, the landscape is changing so rapidly. Every other month, there's something new. What was true last year is no longer true today. In, in, in every, it's streaming and theatrical and on demand and DVD, all of it. You know, these legacy models, I call it the legacy distribution models, which were basically designed by the studios and the larger distribution companies to keep more money in their own pockets because they're businesses. I get it. And we've all heard those kind of predatory stories of the filmmaker signing the bet, their movie away for 15 years and never seeing a dime. We've all heard those stories. What are the distribution options that we have as, distrib- as, as independent filmmakers moving forward from your point of view? Well, look, the, the number one predictor of downstream revenue, you know, I, ironically, right? Everyone's talking about all the disruption, all the stuff that's going on, the chaos of, of streaming with Amazon, Hulu, Netflix coming on board, how the studios are struggling and so on. But still, the number one predictor of downstream revenues for a movie is the U.S. domestic box office. And it's like that that brings a lot of clarity to all the discussions that are happening around the world and in the space, right? Mm -hmm. That is the number one predictor of overall profitability. And what I mean by that is it still sets most of the downstream revenue streams. So if you have a guaranteed domestic release with a a reputable domestic distributor on, say, a thousand screens, your foreign value goes up by four or five X, maybe even more, depending on the package, right? Mm -hmm. So that is still the number one way to go. But the problem is it's really hard to get there, which is why you want to have the option of of bringing your own P&A if you can, because that gives you the option to release yourself and manage it yourself. However, if your budget's right, you can still get enough money out of foreign, and if you structure it right, taking advantage of, of tax credits and things like that, you know you can you can then release also directly to an HBO or a Netflix or a Hulu or an Amazon, right? Now you can also get order you can also get your product ordered and paid for ahead of time in some cases by those guys if you if you're hitting something that they know that they have a need for or a niche. Uh, but if you're an unknown, that's pretty hard. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so at the end of the day, you can, you can self-release digitally. You can put it on a digital platform yourself. The problem is you still need someone to find your movie. You know, the, the marketing, you, you can't release a movie without marketing. 
you have to have a marketing plan. You might have the best movie in the world. You might have the, you know, you might have the next Napoleon Dynamite, for example. But if people can't find it and don't know about it, you're never going to build up that word of mouth. So you've got to have some kind of strategy for releasing when you're making the movie. Right. So you've got to couple the marketing in with it. I mean, the, the distribution landscape is really complex right now. You've got windows collapsing. So it's kind of, you know, it used to be that you would make a fair amount of your money on the theatrical release. If you could recover most of your marketing money in the theatrical release, that was a good thing because then you could try and recover your negative in the downstream, right? Um, you know, the streaming services used to pay a percentage of the domestic box office. The TV syndication would pay a percentage of the domestic box office. And then your, your, your digital and DVD and Blu-ray, you know, digital being transactional, if you pay to watch it again, like a uh, pay-per-view or you, you buy it digitally on iTunes, um, that used to be most of the profit of a movie, right? But that's collapsing with the advent of streaming. That's, 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 where, the, that's where the industry is in a scramble because all that, that secondary transactional revenue is shrinking. And what I call transactional revenue is, again, if a consumer pays to watch it again, either by renting it on, on video on demand or buying it on iTunes or buying a DVD or buying a Blu-ray. And by the way, you know, people are still buying DVDs and Blu-rays. If you have a, if you have a big screen TV and you've got the biggest high, ultra high definition screen, the best way to watch your best sci-fi movie, these Marvel movies, I would argue is still on a Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the best way to replicate what, what you saw in theater because of transfer rates, buffer rates, and all of that stuff is changing. But, you know, each of these are individual segments that I still think I still think physical media of some form or digital media is that's the legacy platform. That's where as a filmmaker, you get to explain your journey. You get you know, that's where people will discover your movie. And I think that's something we do have to solve for. And I know uh, previously there a lot of talk going on about blockchain and how that can apply to how consumers can transfer rights and how they can renew rights. Explain, explain that but, to people because I know a lot of people don't understand blockchain. So I don't understand it fully, so I'm going to qualify. But I, what I understand is that it's basically it's, it's this amazing certification where if you have a share certificate or it's like having a dollar, and it's, I'm not talking Bitcoin, but if you buy the right to a movie, so let's say you buy the right to I Can Only Imagine, you pay $12 or $15, right? Through blockchain technology, it'll identify that I'm the legal owner of that digital copy of that file. That means it can't be pirated, it can't be taken away from me. But that blockchain also identifies that the Irwin brothers own the copyright to that, that, that file as well, right? So it's kind of like this perfect uh, aligning of rights where it's encrypted and protected. So I, I have the right to that movie. I can now sell that to you if I want to. I can sell it to you for $7 or $8. But I own that right, and I can certify that I have that right. So, it's kind of like, like DVDs, Blu-rays, or VHS, any physical media you could do that with as well. Yeah, except for with blockchain, you won't be able to rip it, and I won't be able to share it. So, so for the studios and for the people that are making movies, I mean, let's face it, piracy has been a bane on the business uh, since, since, you know, the, since smart cams and VHS, right? Mm -hmm. and, and piracy is not – it is, is a major issue because the creators, we have so many challenges actually making money on our movie anyway, getting it through the traditional system. People are taking it for free and actually making money off of what you've created. So, you know, piracy is not one of those victimless crimes. I, I really don't, I don't believe it's a victimless crime. People are selling it and making money without actually putting the investment and the time in. And people that have worked on the movie are therefore not getting paid. I mean, that is a fundamental problem. And I think that is one of those things that the blockchain technology can actually help address and fix. I don't think it's there yet, but I think that's the promise of it. That's, that's the way studios are looking at it. That's the way content creators are looking at it and distributors are going, okay, how do I make sure this happens? I mean, the irony is, you know, you, you, you broke the story about the digital platform, the aggregator. Yeah, the uh, distributor platform, yes. That, that, that kind of uh, went sideways or went under and people lost a lot of money. The funny thing is, is that when you're selling Blu-rays and DVDs, there's an audit trail that goes with that. It's like I know that I shipped 
these discs to that retailer and that retailer then sold them and I got paid and I can trace the money all the way coming back, right? With digital technology, ironically, even with the downloading and the, you know, the, the digital downloading on iTunes and, and Amazon, it's almost impossible to audit. Even though there should be a one relationship, there should be a trail that says my credit card was charged $14 for the movie. Therefore, the studio should be able to know that, you know, that I can follow that revenue all the way through the system. It's not it's not that's how it should be, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I was always wondering that myself because I'm like, who, like, you know, how do I really know how much money is coming? There's no way to actually check it. There's no way to audit it. I'm trusting Amazon. I'm trusting iTunes. I'm trusting all of them. They could easily be siphoning off. I'm not saying they are, but easily by either by error or whatever. But we can't really prove that we got all the money that we got. Right. There's there's quite a few opportunities for leakage in the current system. You know, there was leakage. <laughs> Well, there was there was leakage when you were shipping DVDs because because people could make copies of DVDs and they could rip them and then they put them they they put them on the internet and then they're sharing them through BitTorrents and all that kind of stuff and you know that that's a constant process and you know that's where I think again just coming back to my limited knowledge of blockchain that's where blockchain is the promise to actually shut that down but it, it also will I think it also has the potential to create a whole secondary and tertiary market for the content that we've all bought, right? So the days of us having our big physical libraries, you know, of, of us owning all our favorite movies and having them on DVD and Blu-ray, um, I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a digital library. I think our absolute favorite movies we're going to want on whatever the, the hottest format is that's going to give us the best experience at home. So there's a handful of movies that we're going to want to own physically and we'll rebuy, a la Star Wars, right? Going back to your first question, right? When Star Wars comes out again and it's ultra high definition and there's all these interactive features and you've now got a, you know, a, 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 holog- a holographic George Lucas who holographic. talks through the entire movie for you. Exactly. And, and your TV is the size of the wall in your house right. and it's super high definition. Sure. You're going to want to buy it on that format for that movie. But the vast majority of other movies, you're probably going to be okay just to stream it. Right, exactly. You know, or to wait until it comes on syndicated TV or pay TV, that type of thing. If there's even TV then, who knows? <laughs> it's all going to be a series of channel apps and everything's going to be over the top. Without yeah, without question. I mean, things are changing so rapidly. I mean, I, I mean, I, again, I talk to independent filmmakers so often and I'm always getting these questions like, how do I make money? What do I do? This or that. And I've really tried to stay on the, the, the cutting edge. And I love this, this blockchain idea of yours, uh, you know, or the, or the, or the promise of it because it's basically, well, you know, for people who don't understand block, blockchain, it is the basis of cryptocurrency. So it, it, so that, that, then you have to, you know, whoever wants to learn about cryptocurrency, please go do so. That's a, that's a deep well that we will not cover in this episode. But that, but that technology does have so much promise that I always got pissed about that too, because I come from the video store days when I worked in a video store where I could buy my VHS or buy a DVD. I'd hold it. And then when I didn't want it anymore, I would sell it on Amazon or eBay. Digitally, yeah. that does not exist anymore. It, it's, you can't sell a digital copy unless they bootleg it. And even if you bootleg it, yeah. you can't really sell it in a digital way. Uh, you can yeah, – there's that, other ways. There's other business models. Inherently, inherently, as a consumer, I should have the right to sell that, right? I Correct. should be able to sell it to you. And, you know, and that's, that's the stuff that I think blockchain actually enables, and I think it's – it's high time because the reality is when you do buy a digital file now, you're not actually buying it. You're kind of renting it. Oh, yeah. It's right? not. I, I don't you have it. A file to put on your hard drive, but it's not like something else you buy that you can sell to someone else. It's basically, yeah, I'm renting it. Oh, and by the way, if I change my cable company or something like that, God forbid, I'm probably going to lose it. Uh, it just that's, it's, that's, that's the reality. Yeah, without question. Now, do you, act, do you think – and I, I, I believe it is, but do you believe that niche-based films – are the future of independent filmmaking. Because I always tell people all the time that film independent filmmakers can't do a giant like a romantic comedy, a broad spectrum film. You know, a $10 million romantic comedy, unless there's some major star power in it, and that story has to be really you're now you're you're, you're really trying to hit that target so perfectly, you risk a lot. Whereas in if you I always use the vegan chef movie. Uh, you make a vegan chef movie that's romantic and you could target 
that demographic a little bit. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think you have to have a, a clear idea about who your core audience is. But, you know, the exception to that is, you know, you take a movie like uh, The Big Sick mm -hmm. last year, right? Even Napoleon Dynamite, uh, just one of my favorites because it's illustrative. It's a small movie. You know who your core demographic is, but it has the ability to break out because Correct. it deals with the human experience, right? And that, for, for me, so it depends on your, on your genre and what you're doing, right? So I tend to focus on content that unites and inspires people. And, and I, I gravitate towards stories which have a broad appeal, even though I will know exactly who my core audience is, right? So if you're going to do a, 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 a sci-fi movie that's high tech and it's going to appeal to that subset, yeah, you've always got to know who your core audience is and you've got to know where they are and how to get to them. And you've got to know that at the script stage, frankly. But you're always hoping that you're doing – like, I, again, for me, I'm looking for movies that have that breakout potential. And they only break out if they connect beyond that niche. Mm -hmm. Now, now faith-based movies are interesting because in a way they're, they're ultimate niche. It's much like horror movies are kind of a niche. They're a bigger, more commercial niche, right? But if you're going to do a faith-based movie for a niche, then you must do it for a budget. A smart number. A smart number. You've got to do it for a rational number because that's your core and you know that you know it's going to be narrow and deep, right? It's like horror. You know that if you get the core and it, it'll be narrow and deep, but it has the ability to run, mm -hmm. right? It's like get out, like get out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just a, I wouldn't even consider that exactly horror, but you're right. It was that Blumhouse model and it's like, this is, they, they know what to do, you know? So, so yes, I think, I think independent, I don't think independent film is just, is just niche, but I think you, you've got to have a hook that you can hold on to, right? Like when I read a script, I'm, I read scripts backwards from most creatives. I'm thinking, if, I'm thinking of it from a distribution standpoint and how am I going to market it? Where are the scenes that are going to be in my trailer? You know, what you am I going to use that to way. sell the movie? That, that's what I'm looking through. That's what I'm looking through a script looking for. Well, uh, does that help? Yeah, it, it, it helps. I mean, I think that I, I agree with what you're saying and that potential to break out is that home run. So we, you know, as well as I do, we get one, maybe two of those a year, you know, if, and then there's yep. maybe multiple levels of that breakout. So it could be, you know, if I, if I could only imagine made 25 or $30 million, you would have been, you know, they would have been ecstatic, like, oh my God, you know, yeah. because it was a, a super hit. Uh, but then you occasionally get the grand slam, which is, you know, tenfold of what the budget is or something along those lines. Um, but I do, I do truly believe that. I, I, again, keeping that when you, when your budget goes higher, you've got to have something to to um, to hedge your bets. So it's yeah. either cast, it's either it's either cast, story, niche, genre, something that's going to hedge those bets. The higher that budget goes, sure. sure. And then, and I'm always telling people to drop the budget as low as you possibly can while still being able to create an MVP, a, 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 um, a minimal viable product. To get to to realize your dream and realize your vision, but get a product to the marketplace and not just look at this as an art form. It is an art form, but it is a business and it is a very expensive art form to to, to work with. Do you agree? Absolutely. I mean, there's so many independent creatives that I've come across that know exactly how to make a movie for a budget, and and that's that's a massive skill by itself. Mm -hmm. Got it. But these days, you have to know how you're going to get that money back too. You can't just know that. You have to know the other part as well. So it's kind of like, like you're saying. If I'm going to do a niche movie, uh, I, you know, I'll use an example. If you're going to do a, an inner city basketball movie, okay. okay, it's probably not going to travel very well. You're going to have to make your money in the U.S. Now, the markets are changing. Don't get me wrong. It's changing. Maybe you can sell it in China if they stop tweeting about it, uh, you know, the NBA and they settle at hash. But – but you know what I'm saying? It's like if you do a very local movie, you've got to know that it's probably not going to travel well. Therefore, you make it that way and your distribution plan fits that accordingly, right? So you know that you're going to make all your money in that local market. Mm -hmm. And then anything you make overseas is going to be gravy. It'll be incidental, but that's not core to my business plan, right? It's like a baseball movie. You do a baseball movie. There's only a few countries in the world that it's really going to work. Um, if you do a, a movie about NFL football, you know, Blindside's probably like an exception. 
that traveled really well because it wasn't really about football. And it was you know, Sandra Bullock too. And Sandra Bullock is an yeah. international star. Yeah. So th- that's not the example, but it's like there are certain genres that you know are, that you know are pretty niche, and they're probably not going to break out. Mm-hmm. And and you've got to you've got to you've got to have that plan and that understand. You've got to be honest in the development stage of your movie. It's kind of like uh, you know, if I use another analogy, if you're in a, if, let's say you're in Colombia and you are a baker and you make this certain Colombian pastry that is very well known in that segment of the country, not even the whole country, just that segment of the country. It's a yeah. niche product. But yeah. then you say, I'm going to throw in thirty million on this pastry because I think. The rest of the world is going to – and we've seen – how many products like that we've seen that are culturally great, but the second they yeah. try to break into the American market or another market, they just like, I would never eat pig. Like yeah, it's trying to sell like a, a, a Big Mac in India. Didn't go well. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, see, now that gets into the heart of the DNA of the creative, right? Again, coming back to what our company's strategy is, our game plan is to make movies that will work in the U.S. marketplace. That is one of the lenses that we use. It's not everyone's lens. That's just our lens. Mm -hmm. There are going to be filmmakers that are going to go, I only want a movie that's going to appeal to the African audience or it's only going to work for the Indian audience. And by the way, I've got a business plan. It's going to work just fine, right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's totally – those are all viable options and plans. But you calibrate and scale your production appropriately, okay? Um, But again, for us – we're we're creating content that we believe will, and we're going to cast it, and we're going to package it. We we want it to work in the U.S. marketplace because generally, if you can break it in the U.S. marketplace, it's a pretty good indicator that it'll travel elsewhere. Yeah, and and it's 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 just fascinating. I've I've just seen. I mean, I know of filmmakers like um, Isaac Namwaha, who is a, a filmmaker in Uganda. And he yeah. makes films locally and he created a whole industry in Uganda. Yeah. And he makes his films for $200, $200 yeah. US. I see that's really exciting for us. Exactly. And now Africa is turning into a whole thing. I mean there's a lot of uh, Nollywood and all these kind of there's wonderful so much, There's so much media growth potential uh, in Africa. Right now, and it's a it's a great thing. But the funny thing is, with with Isaac's example, he made these little two hundred dollar movies that were action, really just fun and action, and the visual effects are horrendous, and you know, according to our standards. But his audience has loved it, and then he got a cult following worldwide. So now he travels the world with these little movies, but he had breakout potential. But I I promise you, as I interviewed him, he had no indication of ever getting out of his little town but he but he's gonna break out he yeah he did already he already yeah. has and people are like where did this guy come from well he's been doing this for a long time he didn't just show 40, up and go, here it is right he I mean, 40 features under his belt <laughs> well, tyler perry's a brilliant example oh, of that yeah just brilliant right just unbelievable he he saw a niche that was completely underserved which is the african-american woman right Nobody was c- catering to them at all, and he saw that opportunity, and he saw the opportunity for positive messaging, and he filled that gap. And it, it's like kudos and credit to him as he he saw that niche and he recognized what it was worth, and he committed himself to it. And it's just one of those amazing success stories. But it wasn't an overnight success. It was it was uh, it was a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, just a lot of courage, frankly. Mm-hmm. No, I remember seeing Diary of the Black uh, of a Mad Black Woman when it first came out, which was a big, yeah. huge deal when it came out. It was like, how can they make this movie? And there was a lot of controversy and all this stuff. I remember that was like in the '90s, if I remember. Yeah, it was in the '90s when that came out, and he was just getting started. And now, fast forward 2019, he's got a studio in in Atlanta that's bigger than Disney, Warner's, and Paramount all put together. <laughs> yeah, isn't it cool? It's insane. Like, those, those are the stories that get me really excited. I mean, you know. Frankly, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff going on. So like NTB, our company, to talk about my company a little Mm -hmm. bit. Sure. Our headquarters is in South Africa because there's exciting stuff going on in South Africa. What most people don't know is that all the major studios, Netflix and Amazon included, are shooting down there because it doubles for just about anywhere in the world. The exchange rate is fantastic. There's an incredibly uh, strong local crew down there, and there's a great tax incentive. You know, the problem is it's a long way away, but – 
it's like there's something exciting to me about building these industries and places in in these more remote places where technology is is possible. It makes it possible, right? And you get these great crews, and the quality of the production happening down there is remarkable. So we're not exclusively producing movies down there. We just have a, a, a very strong proclivity to want to do more down there because all the studios are doing it down there. They see what we see. But what happens is all the IP and all the, the upside goes comes back to the States or goes back to Europe, etc. And it's like we can do this. We can cast it this way. We can create movies that are made for the American market because it's already happening in South Africa now. And, you know, South Africa has just been a country that has consistently um, hit above its weight class, shall we say. And with its message of diversity, it, it truly is a, a, a remarkable place right now, given its history. And I actually think South Africa, being a former South African, uh, has a message for the world right now in terms of diversity, in terms of unity, in terms of, you know, kind of a message of humanity and bringing people together. And I think it's what we all need right now. And I don't know. Again, you can tell that's the kind of content that really draws me uh, that draws me uh, uh, out is stuff that brings people together where we share our common humanity and challenges us. And and there's there would, needs to be more producers like you out there, sir, doing doing the good work that you're doing. So I uh, I, I thank, you. thank you. I thank you very much. I wanted to ask you. Can you tell me about your new project? I am all girls. Yeah. Um, this one's a very cool little project uh, we did. It's it's a it's a great indie. Um, had a very talented director uh, Donovan Marsh who did Hunter Killer with Gerard Butler that released last year. And coming off that big movie, um, he wanted to do something that was kind of small and personal, but had an impact. And in South Africa, I don't know um, a story had broken a couple of years ago about this human trafficking that was going on uh, in South Africa and. It became very clear that human trafficking is a global plight. It's a massive problem that people don't want to talk about. And it's happening in the U.S. It's not a South African problem. It's not an Asian problem or a Middle Eastern problem. It's truly a global problem. And, you know, slavery has been a problem since the beginning of time. So we wanted to create a movie that was commercial. It was entertaining. But we wanted to explore the world of the people that actually go into the human trafficking world to try and stop it. And, and ascertain what, uh, what the impact is on those people. So this is kind of a crime thriller. It starts off as kind of a vigilante movie. Uh, and and you real, it starts off as a serial killer movie, but then you realize it's a vigilante movie. And there's a conflict between the investigating police officer who realizes that this killer might actually be doing her work for her. Uh, where she's constrained by the rules and the regulations. This, uh, this vigilante is going to the place that she can't go, and you know she, she's she's torn by by duty, and she wants to do it the right way. Now she's like, okay, do I bring this person in? And then she discovers the identity of the killer. Uh, so it's kind of a very commercial uh, thriller. We have it's uh, two two female leads, uh, two great South African actresses, um, and it basically is based on real events. It's based on stuff that actually occurred in South Africa in the 90s. But when you look at uh, the Me Too movement, you look at what's going on, we wanted to create a movie that want, that would wake people up and want to get them more involved in anti-trafficking and just being aware of what's going on in their own communities. Um, and that's one of the reasons we created this movie, but we recognize it's entertainment as well. So we're going to entertain people. It's a, it, the, the cinematography is stunning. We tested it in front of a U.S. audience. We tested just above the norms uh, and above and well above the norms against the female targeted audience. Mm -hmm. But you know, what was really gratifying to us is more than 85% of the recruited audience in the U.S. said they wanted to get more involved in anti-trafficking activities. That's awesome. Um, and ultimately for us as independent filmmakers, that's the good housekeeping seal of approval for us. Um, and actually, we've got a, a song from uh, Pearl Jam on the soundtrack uh, the, that, that hit uh, Daughter. And, uh, and Nancy Wilson from Heart saw one of the rough cuts of the movie, and she was so moved. She actually did a cover of it that will just blow you away. And she is, she is so talented, but this song just captures the energy and the defiance and the, and the brokenness and the strength. It, just, it really epitomized what we created in the movie. And you know, when that happens, it's really magical. That's amazing. I look forward to seeing that movie. So you're doing good work out there, and I'm so uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to come on the show and talk, uh, drop Thank some you. knowledge bombs on the show. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Sure. So, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? 
get into the business, do something and find people to learn from. Build, build a network, start building your network right now where you are. Whoever you went to film school with, those are probably the guys you're going to work with again in the future and make sure your networks are all supporting each other. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Sure. Um, if it's not coming together correctly, you know, be patient. And, and patient sometimes it's not – sometimes if it's not coming together, there's a reason why. And you've got to be open to the possibility that maybe it's not meant to be. And then you move on to the next. So cut your losses. There's kind of a, a, a balance between cutting your losses – and being the stoic champion of the movie, right? If you're hearing the same answer again and again from many people, it's probably about right. But you know, but but don't don't let that uh, crush your creative instinct. And yeah. I know that balance, but yes, and and you don't have to win every battle. Yes, yes, especially in this in this business, it's very difficult to win every battle. <laughs> Figure out which ones you must win, and be okay to lose a few. It's okay. Now, what was the biggest fear you had to overcome when making your very first feature film? Uh, the biggest fear I had to overcome in making uh, it was actually it was a, it was based on a true story, and for me, my biggest fear was that we would accurately portray uh, the life of this person whose movie we did, and that was a movie called Six Below. Okay, and we wanted to, we wanted to accurate, uh, you know, because because to me, when you're doing a true story of someone's life, it's a sacred trust. And, and I really wanted to make sure that we delivered on that and, and of course, made it on time. Of course. And on, on time and on budget, sir. And on time and on budget. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, uh, that's a rough question. I've got to say Apocalypse Now is up there. Mm -hmm. um, Patton's up there. There's definitely a Coppola thing going there. Mm -hmm. um, Apocalypse Now, mainly because I, one of my favorite books growing up, I was a peculiar kid, was Heart of Darkness. You're a very peculiar um, kid. <laughs> so, so I love that translation of it. It was just uh, stunning. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's probably it. And, I, and I've got <laughs> – this is, this is not good, but probably Dumb and Dumber. Hey, you know, Dumb and Dumber <laughs> is just I, good and stuff. And something about Mary. I mean, uh, I, I love the, the Farley, Farley – early work uh yeah and and the fact the, the fact that peter farley is, had just did uh, uh the green book too yeah, is, is stunning to me and and as a filmmaker I, I i love i love his work and he always has something more in his movies even his his crazy comedies there's there's something just there's just such a great heart in there the um yeah. wouldn't it have been interesting though to see apocalypse now by george lucas who was originally slated to direct that movie <laughs> Yeah, that would have been an yeah. interesting <laughs> film. Well, you know, one of my anecdotes um, with Francis Ford Coppola. So when we were working on the DVD set, this might be the segment you want to cut, but it's like Gosh, no. uh, what I'd say to young filmmakers, just remember that the thing that you're doing uh, that gets you fired might be the thing you're remembered for. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is that my, uh, we did this whole uh, thing with Francis Ford Coppola around the making of Patton. And, uh, you know, we did a special edition and so on. And he talked about that opening scene in Patton and that opening monologue. And he was actually fired. He was about to be fired off of uh, Godfather, apparently. This is how the story goes. He, he was fired off of uh, Patton and he was about to be fired off of Godfather when he won the Academy Award for Patton. Okay. And that – so it's kind of funny how that works, right? This industry is not as predictable as you would seem. It's not a straight line. And, and you look at what the, a great filmmaker like that and the creative risks that he took and conventional wisdom at the time was that this scene sucks. Why are you doing this? This is terrible. He got an Academy Award for it and he got to finish The Godfather as a result of that. Uh, and that's, that's true story stuff. And imagine, imagine The Godfather without Francis Ford Coppola. Well, you can't. There is no Godfather without Francis Ford Coppola. You know, yeah. so – so, so I guess to the young filmmakers out there, it's not a straight line. It's, it can be a pretty bumpy road. And just stay, just stay the course, man. Without the question, I promise you, everyone listening right now, whatever you think is going to happen in your career, it is not going to happen. Not like it's that. Gonna, it's going to be different. Exactly. And if it does happen like that, God bless you. Be thankful. But if it doesn't, just remember it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Exactly. Without question. Simon, uh, where can people find you and more about your work that you're doing? 
Um, well, I'm pretty much on LinkedIn, and we have a company website, uh, Intiba Pictures. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's a bit of a mouthful. It's I'll put NT- it on. The, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes somewhere. On the show or NTB Pictures, you can see more about us and what, the stuff that we're working on. So. Yeah, Simon, thank you th- very much. Simon, thank you so much for being on the show, and I do appreciate you taking the time out, man. Cheers. Thanks, Alex. It's been a lot of fun. I want to thank Simon for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Simon. If you want links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including links to his films, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 386. And guys, next week I will have a big announcement. I have been working quietly in the background in the indie film hustle labs if you will to bring something really special to you guys so i want you to keep an eye out on all the social media platforms and i will announce it in next week's podcast on the film entrepreneur podcast the bulletproof screenwriting podcast and of course this podcast something very 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 exciting guys i hope you guys are holding up okay during this quarantine i know it's hard i know Oh, God, trust me. I, I I want life to go back to where it was or at least some sort of normalcy, but it is it is difficult. I, I'm not going to lie to you. It is very difficult, especially if you have kids at home. <laughs> it is definitely not uh, for the faint at heart, but we will get through this, guys. And I, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. Take, t- take this time. Take this time that you have at home and educate yourselves. Prepare yourselves. Write learn as much as you can because when the doors open up again or when these new opportunities open up again, I want you, the tribe, to be ready to take advantage of them. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, stay home, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.